Um, yeah, welcome back to the final, uh, this is the final session of the Disruption Network Lab. Woohoo! <laughs> and uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here in this, uh, what's been, a, I think, a really incredible series kind of conceived of and led by uh, Tatiana. And hello to online audiences as well. I think this is the first event that's uh, been live streamed, so that's another first, which is great. Um, so this is the panel. The, this panel's called Stunts and Dumps, the Making of a Viral Cause. And we have with us uh, a, a very kind of, I'd say, a very profound panel, panel here, a profound mix of uh, practices and tactics that we're going to hear about. So we have uh, Mustafa Albasam, alias Tiflo, who's the former core member of Olsec uh, in the UK. We have uh, Jeanne Peters, who's co-founder of Peng Collective, uh, based here in Berlin. Um, MC McGrath, who's going to be starting us off in a minute, uh, who's the founder of the Transparency Toolkit in the USA, and I think based here in Berlin also. And Andrea Natella, uh, former Luther Blissett conspirator, creative director of Guerrilla Marketing and Kook Art Agency uh, from Italy. Um, I discovered when I was kind of looking at the bios that we have two former, or two, two people who claim to have once been Luther Blissett, so both uh, Jeanne Peters and Andrea. And I, I, so it's at this point that I want to confess that I am. Uh, sometimes Karen Blissett, who is the net-born daughter of Karen Elliott and Luther Blissett. So we have a kind of proliferation here of these uh, um, folk heroes of the Information Society uh, gathered in this panel, which I think it, it, this kind of adop adoption of uh, multiple identities and it is kind of part, part of a core part of the tactics that we're discussing. So... Following the thread of kind of practices that create effects and spread a, an emancipatory spirit in economical, social, and political systems, this panel reflects on the practice of political stunts and data dumps uh, by provoking intelligence disruptions, virality interventions, and corporate hijacking. And now, in the US general election, uh, maybe the inevitable climax of a long-running debate around rights and securities, we hear Hillary Clinton really quite casually dismissing and ridiculing people's concerns for both freedom of speech and privacy in the face of the threat of global and domestic terrorism. And uh, I was talking with Marie before also about how kind of with the recent increase in viol violent spectacle on, on kind of European soil, I, I think that there's a conversation to be had and maybe we'll come back to this. I'd just like people to reflect on it while we're hearing about people's work, about what, what new forms of stunts are needed and what practices are emerging in, in, in response to this, in, in response to this kind of uh, fairly kind of horrifying trajectory that we find ourselves on, but, but we'll leave that for later discussion. So uh, the format will be, um, I'm going to introduce each speaker and they will give their presentations for about 20 minutes. We're not stopping for questions unless someone jumps up and has a really urgent question that they really need to know the answer to. Uh, so we'll keep the flow that we've, we've ordered the panel in the way that we think will give us a good flow. And then at the end, we'll have a s small discussion amongst ourselves if it feels right, and then we'll open it up for questions. So um, let's start off with uh, introducing MC McGrath. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, so MC is the co-founder of the Transparency Toolkit, which is a non-profit organization that uses open data and makes free software to essentially to watch the watchers, so to better understand surveillance and human rights abuses. Uh, he's a Thiel Fellow and an Echoing Green Fellow. And uh, looking, looking at the toolkit this morning, it's got a, a kind of 
fairly astonishing set of resources on there, including the first comprehensive uh, database of, Sn of the Snowden documents. Um, MC's graduated from Boston University with a degree in civic technology and has also done research at the MIT Media Lab. So I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you. Hey. There it is. Hi, so I'm MC, and I work on Transparency Toolkit, and today I'd like to talk to you about some of the dangers of the internet. Because the internet is a very dangerous place, and there are a lot of dangerous people on the internet that you should watch out for. For example, there are scammers, and there are identity thieves, and there are also some dangerously annoying things, like spam, and pop-up ads, and there's some crazy people, too, that you really need to look out for, like internet trolls and lulzsec. And some of the dangers are not so obvious, because they look like they're good things at first, but are really quite harmful, like addictive games and uh, dangerously cute kittens. And there are some more subtle hidden dangers as well, like people who sell your data and corporations that don't care about your privacy. But all of these things aren't even the worst. These on the internet, they're also murderers. And they're recruiting other murderers, like the Islamic State and the US intelligence community. So the internet is this crazy place, and everyone uses it. And everyone uses it for everything. And they're often posting lots of data publicly. And the intelligence community has realized this. This is a flyer for a startup called Zero Fox. And what they do is they use social media to track down ISIS and other terrorist groups. And so the intelligence community contracts with them and they use the data that they collect. But they don't just use these techniques to track ISIS. This is a different program. It's a brochure from Lockheed Martin. They uh, have this software called LM Wisdom. And this is used to also to collect data from social media and help people analyze it. And in particular, Lockheed Martin, this major intelligence contractor, works with Walmart to track their employees that are unionizing and organizing for better working conditions and uses this data to find the main organizers and fire them. So the internet is necessary for the operations of many, many different groups, from activists to companies to terrorists to the intelligence community itself. And these groups use the internet to further their work, so it's difficult to avoid leaving a data trail. And even the intelligence community leaves a data trail online. When companies need to find someone to intercept our data, they post job listings online. When people want jobs working on secret surveillance programs, they post their resumes online, publicly. When the government finds companies to help them figure out who to target in drone strikes, there's a trail of that online, too. So you can see the internet isn't just for porn, it's also for spies and murderers. So, well, the intelligence community complains a lot about how other people are leaking data about their activities. They really leak a lot of this data themselves. And if they're leaking this data themselves, then why can't we use this data? Why can't we collect it? Why can't we use it to find the people who are involved in torture and killing? Why can't we use it to figure out how they're intercepting, intercepting and using our communications? So to this end, I started collecting various resumes. And we were searching for resumes that included secret surveillance programs mentioned in the Snowden documents, major intelligence contractors, other relevant terms like signals intelligence and targeting office of primary interest. And we built up a database of over 27,000 uh, resumes of people in the intelligence community. And it's called IC Watch, Intelligence Community Watch. And I'd like to go through and show you some of the uh, interesting things and sorts of things that are in this database. So this is Lauren Russell. She currently works at L3, um, major intelligence contractor. But she started her career 
working at the U.S. Army in 2008 as an interrogator in Iraq. She said that the information that she gathered from her interrogations was used to capture dozens of people. It also says, luckily, that part of her job was to assure safe and humane treatment of hundreds of detainees. So it's not necessarily all bad. You can find some humanity in these as well. But later, she moved on to a company called Excellus. And in this job listing, um, it's particularly nefarious. She says she utilized, uh, utilized F3EA methodology to conduct analysis on raw infused human SIGINT, and comment, helping to create 125 targeting support packets and then nominated to the joint priority effects list for kinetic targeting. So this isn't necessarily obvious what this is saying. It takes a little bit of decoding because there's a lot of code words used in it. So, Signals intelligence is what the National Security Agency does. This is a lot of the programs mentioned in the Snowden documents refer to intercepting signals and getting intelligence from them. Communications intelligence is similar, though it refers specifically to communication signals. So this is what the NSA does when they're reading your email. Human intelligence is the intelligence gained from human sources, so from informants or from interrogations. The Joint Priority Effects List is an extrajudicial kill and capture list in Afghanistan that for the US military and its allies. F3A stands for Find, Fix, Finish, Exploit, and Analyze. It's a rapid data collection and analysis methodology often used in the intelligence industry and the military. And recently found out that it's often used in drone strikes, as mentioned quite a bit in the drone papers. And kinetic targeting means attacking a moving target. So going back to Lauren Russell's profile, again, she says she utilized F3EA methodology to conduct analysis on raw infused human SIGINT and comment, helping to create 125 targeting support packets, then nominated it to the joint priority effects list for kinetic targeting. Basically, she means that based on intercepted communications and information from human sources, potentially information gained under duress from torture, uh, she's deciding who should be killed. But not everyone is totally okay with killing, and some of these profiles tell very interesting human stories. This is one of my favorites, um, Solomon Vernado. He, um, I first came across this profile because I was searching for profiles that had code words mentioned in the Snowden documents, and he mentions a whole bunch of them in one of his first jobs back in 2004, 2005. Um, he was in the US Army, and he talks about using X Keyscore. He was a collection manager, manager there. This is actually one of the first known mentions of X Keyscore. Um, but this ended up being the least interesting thing about his profile. Later gone, he goes to work for L3, and as part of his work there, he says that they identified, collected, and performed direction finding of specified target signals using pen and trace display view and segs. But I had no idea what pen and trace was. It sounded interesting, but never heard of it. So I did some searching, and I found another resume that very nicely defined it. Um, it said that they used remote access to operate airborne collection platform pen and trace. It sounds like some sort of drone signals intelligence collection platform. But even that's not the most interesting part. Later on, Solomon Bernardo says that he, in the next, in this, later on in that same listing, he says that he lobbied for independent review of collection management processes, mission scope, and daily duties. So it sounded like he tried to change something about how data was being collected, and that ended up not going very well. Um, after this, he has one other job in the intelligence community. He worked in the intelligence community for over 20 years, and in his next job, he stays there for only two months. In this job, he's also doing SIGINT analysis with data from drones, actually data from Predator drones, specifically based on some of the tools that he mentions using. And then he leaves this job after two months and leaves the intelligence community entirely this time. And he starts working at this used car dealership as a used car salesman. So that's quite a huge career change, and it sounds like he might have been upset with how things are going and couldn't figure out how to fix it and just found another job instead. So another example. This is Michael Acosta. Back in 2011 and 2012, he worked at Guantanamo Bay. 
he was primarily trying to find out about attacks on Guantanamo Bay itself, it sounds like, rather than doing it, getting intelligence from detainees for the sake of itself. He says that as part of his work, he monitored 15 detainees and collaborated with, behavioral science, with the behavioral science consultation team to garner key psychological inputs for over 150 detainee assessments used to inform camp leadership of potential threats. And then later on, he goes and works for the Air Force for a couple years. And he talks about how part of his work, he produced detailed pre-mission briefs for geospatial analysts and mission operation commanders working live unmanned aerial vehicle full motion video exploitation missions. Um, so something to do with drones, whether it's predator or second drones, it's hard to tell the way he later talks about targeting when he says that he was responsible for the production, maintenance, and upgrade of DGS-2 mission critical intelligence databases, which include high value target development folders, regional threat briefs, mission storyboards, and mission target logs, which document full motion video mission rollups. But neither of these are the main reason I wanted to talk about him. I um, noticed that on his profile, he mentions that for two years he was also coaching a high school baseball team while he was doing some of the drone intelligence management. Um, and then after that, in October of this year, he starts working at a new company called SOS International. Never heard of this company before. And what's even stranger is I noticed at the top of his LinkedIn profile is that he's looking for baseball opportunities in Germany. So I have a bit of an interesting task for any German journalist that might be interested in looking into this. I went on to the SOS International website and I have a very handy job listing page that lists the locations that they have uh, offices. And there are these six cities in Germany along with Guantanamo Bay where they work. Um, and if anyone is interested in trying to maybe track them down, figure out what they're doing, um, it, based on his past work history, it sounds like it's probably something rather sketchy. Um, let me know and maybe in the process we can find a baseball team for him to coach in Germany. So why does this matter? Why look at individuals? This strategy scares a lot of people and it scares a lot of the people in this database. We got some angry phone calls and angry emails from the people in the database. Um, but I don't really mean it in a way, in a scary way. I mean it in a couple different ways. One of the reasons that I think it's important to look at individuals is that institutions are made up of people. And the data trail that these people leave is also part of the data trail of those institutions. And that the people are also the ones who perpetuate the institutions. They're the people who go to work every day and they do the work that leads to the actions of the NSA, of the US military, of the CIA. They're the people who do that. And when these actions involve killing or involved illegal surveillance, it's useful to give a face to the people behind it. Yes, it's useful for accountability reasons, but I don't think it's fair to hold one person responsible for absolutely everything. I think that even the people who aren't decision makers share in the responsibility, but I don't think that everyone, any one person should be blamed for all of the problems. I think it's something caused by many, many different people. But the biggest thing I think is that we, when we start to look at them as people, we can start to understand them as people. And I think this is something that the intelligence community fails horribly at. Torture techniques are specifically designed to dehumanize people. When people are intercepting your communications, they're distanced from you. They're not looking at you as a person. They're looking at your data. Metadata, that's designed to distance it from people. But when we look at them as people, we can realize that they're not evil people, that they're normal people. They have friends, they have families, they have good intentions, and they're also fallible. And we can start to understand um, from this, we can start to understand how they see the world, what worries them, what hopes they have. And we can maybe start to understand how we can change their actions by interacting with them in this way. And it might seem scary at first, but ultimately I think that doing this is more productive than just looking at it at the very high level. Because the high level is an abstraction that doesn't let us understand the actual problems and people behind it. But I don't want to just understand people. At Transparency Toolkit, we try to understand all levels of how things fit together, from the low level with the individuals of who does what and why, up to what companies are working on what programs, how they're interacting, how things fit together. And so we've also started to make other sets of documents more accessible. 
For example, we made this uh, search tool for all of the published Snowden documents that lets people search through the full text of the documents, browse by the code words or the countries mentioned, and then just, just generally search through them in, the, in one place for the first time. And we also made an archive of all of the hacking team emails. Over the summer, there was this large data dump that was anonymously published about a uh, company called Hacking Team. It's an Italian company that makes intrusion software and sells it to governments around the world. This software is often used to spy on activists and journalists and track them and all sorts of things. And this data had a lot of details about the software itself, who they were selling to, and just generally how the company worked. Um, but it was gigantic, it was 400 gigabytes, and many people didn't have the hard drive space or the internet connectivity to be able to download the full data dump. So the first thing we did, actually with Mustafa's help, is we uh, mirrored the data and uh, made a mirror that people could go to to download just one file or just parts that they needed or to browse it in the browser. And then we realized that the emails in this data are particularly inaccessible because they could only be opened on this one program on Windows and some of them were corrupted and it was just a bad situation but they were also particularly interesting. So we made a search tool in the browser where people can browse through them just like they could their normal email and see the threads and also have some uh, utilities to view the networks between senders and receivers and how those relate to each other. So the intelligence community already has tools to collect and use data in these ways. And, but researchers and activists and journalists and human rights groups don't have those tools at all. So we've started to build free software to do some of these things. And this includes tools to help people collect data from many public sources online. So to be able to just type terms into a box and click go and get a collection of data that's easy for them to browse and access. And tools to be able to match data on the same person or the same company across many different data sources so that you can browse the data in an easier to access form. And also tools to do the opposite, to go into documents and to extract data out of them on a person or a surveillance program and to see what's in those. And finally, tools to make it easier to browse through the documents, so search tools, tools so that you can see things in network graphs and maps. And from this, we hope to enable anyone to make any of the databases that we've made so far. So things like ICWatch or the Snowden Document Search or the Hacking Team Archive in less than a day and entirely without programming. And when people can do this, this quickly and this easily, this is going to be quite powerful because it means that researchers and journalists and activists and anyone can start to use data in the same way that intelligence agencies and governments can now. And when that's possible, it starts to enable us to build external structures of accountability that aren't dependent on the existing ones. And we need this because the existing structures have shown that they fail again and again and again. So we need to build our own. And I think that collecting and using information this way is one of the ways we can do that. Thanks. Thank you. That was uh, incredibly impressive and very powerful, I think. Thank you very much. Um, so next up, we have uh, Andrea Natella, former Luther Blissett, uh, conspirator and creative di director of Guerrilla Marketing and Cook Agency. Um, it says here that in 1999, he created Men in, Men in Red and the, the first Marxist U UF ology group, and, uh, but Andrea confessed to me earlier that they produced a whole lot of very boring things as part of this program. <laughs> um, but we're glad, that, we're glad that you did it. It sounds cool. Um, he founded Guerrilla Marketing in 2003, which was a fake ad advertising agency that designed subversive hoaxes and created art projects exploring pornography, politics, and advertising. And in 2009, he, he founded Kook Art Agency, a real advertising agency this time. Uh, 
And also, he's the creator of thisman.org, which is a website about the story of a face that everybody is dreaming around the world. Okay, so I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> First of all, I have to excuse me for my poor English, so be patient with me. And uh, I would like to start talking about disruption because in advertising disruption, he used it as a creative approach invented by the Jean-Marie Drew, that is French, uh, French advertiser. And it's a method of brainstorming used by one of the most important agency of the world, TBWA. Um, disruption is a process that starts from convention and bring to a new vision. Uh, it's a projection of the company, of the brand, of the product in the future. Uh, the, the vision in this kind of view is a, 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 a utopia, a commodity utopia. Uh, an happy view, new way of consumerism. In my work, I try to polarize this uh, disruption, uh, and I consider the vision in a, in a very dystopic way. Uh, Bruce Sterling used uh, another term, is design fiction. Uh, is the disbelief, you, uh, the deliberate use of diegetic prototypes to suspend disbelief about reality. It's a kind of what if, but with concrete impact on reality. This comes from an idea that a storytelling that pretend to be real can impact reality as real, as uh, a famous sociologist William Thomas says in the 1928, if men define situation as real, they are real in their consequence. For Bruce Sterling, the question is, could Science, fact, science fiction create realities? Of course, yes. Karl Marx do this, or Ron Hubbard do this. Hubbard was a science fiction writer, and uh, he creates scientologists. He, he creates engram, engram as uh, a design object. Of course, the science fictions, fiction is not funny, neither good. I try a different approach to suspend this belief about change. In 2002, I started to use uh, this approach with guerrillamarketing.it. Uh, it was a real fake agency because uh, uh, now I am a creative director of Cook Art, Art Agency and it is a real uh, advertising agency. But when we start, uh, uh, the team uh, of the group of guerrilla marketing nobody had any experience or skill in advertising. We simply had uh, started with some cultural jamming action uh, um, or pranks uh, and pretending to be an advertising and not uh, an artistic or uh, political group. Our goal was to explode and explore some economic contradiction um, between the brand logic. If consumers are part of product, production process, as Karl Marx says, how far does brand go? Before Facebook, we try to underline that consumers become workers. Consumers invent new things. They spread brand. They create awareness each time they dress a new uh, shirt. Uh, when they drive a car or use a product, consume, create value as fun in a football stadium, as client in a supermarket with a loyalty card, a user who share idea on social network. So, consumer must fight as working class. One of our first campaign was a simple t-shirt. It's spazio disponibile. It's a available space. Uh, put your ad here. And uh, it's a shirt without any brand, and, uh, but they have a simple and easy request. If, if you want I address your brand, you have to pay me for this. Uh, one of our first uh, work was espropriproletari.com. Um, uh, in 2005, um, we launched this web site 
at times some uh, autonomous group uh, in Italy restart using proletarian expropriation as a form of civil disobedience against crisis. They stole goods from bookshop, restaurant, uh, supermarket asking for price reduction. As a result, they had back several people arrested, and uh, some uh, of them are friends of mine. And uh, to the other side, uh, a political re reaction against them. Uh, with, the, um, with the web side, we tried to overturn uh, the two approach. We noticed that each press article about uh, these robberies was was always uh, reporting the brand uh, of point of purchase, uh, sometime of the goods uh, that was uh, uh, stolen with, with big photos. So we create a dot-com website, a revolutionary service, able to grant high visibility and media attention to any brands. We offer a special condition in, fun in function of quality of goods uh, company allowed to be installed. We also work at on relationship within, be, between supply and demand. Young people, precarious workers, students, or retired uh, could join uh, the team and take part to this very innovative job. Uh, first leg of proletarian expropriation. They were paid with the whole load they stolen. In the Melwine company, pay us for the whole service. Uh, we received a lot of uh, requests uh, by potential workers and uh, a few requests by, some, uh, by a, a chain of bookshop, but when we go forward with uh, negotiation, they, they give up. <laughs> we have a page with clients uh, uh, with the name of the um, company uh, that was in past victim of uh, proletarian expropriation, and uh, just one uh, wrote us through the lawyer asking to remove the links. Uh, the other, I think, say, oh, you know, it's okay. Uh, <laughs> I think with this uh, website, we found a point of equilibrium with the, between brand awareness and breakdown of uh, capitalism, oh, or this is our goal. <laughs> Another question we explore uh, a year later, it's 2006, was about porn. This is some of press coverage of uh, expropriate proletary in Italian, sorry. Um, there is a limit pushing goods for capitalistic, economic, or advertising. After robbery, we explored uh, pornography. Pornography is the most wanted content on the web, but the most viral one, you know. Uh, several companies use light pornography, but usually they never cross boundary. Porn induces emotions such as desire, excitement, arousal. The same feeling customers could have for brands. At the same time, brands are part of, of our everyday life. And so, it's obvious they appear in several porn images, sometimes in the background, on clothes uh, and so on. We launched the website as first product placement website for exhibitionists, a place to build a commercial relationship between company who want his brand appear in poor images, and the exhibitionist who agrees to be paid to do this. We indexed uh, porn with same, the same kind of category, but we don't use uh, MILF, uh, uh, Big Bamboo, and so on, but we use commodity categories. So, for example, beverage, uh, cosmetics, motors, retail, uh, it's perfect for the outdoor images, uh, and so on. <laughs> for this website, at the end, we, we, we want a special mention for breakthrough performance at Break Cameo Hour in 2006. That's why it's a real website, it's a real uh, prize for product placement. And maybe this uh, project uh, is of 10 years ago, and I think could be now a, co a good idea for, some, for a startup, I don't know, maybe someone here in... Uh, <laughs> then this is in of, uh, 2011, it's crash advertising, a simple. Each time a car crash somewhere, you always get a crew of curious of onlooker. Why don't convert this attention in brand attention? Sometimes company 
could be interested in. I think the insurance company, love office, automotive industries, road assistance, uh, or I don't know. With cash franchising, we hire people to alert us uh, in the event, in the case of any car accident. Crash advertisements, crash advertise team arrive on the spot. And showing banner and giving Savity West with brand to other people involved in the accident. Then we take picture and video and spread the web because the car accident is another viral content on uh, on uh, YouTube and uh, and the website. Of course, of course, we pay a revenue to the people uh, that advise us uh, or that maybe could cause accident to have some revenue. <laughs> Get advertise is very easy. Choose a spot, be creative, make a share, and spread buzz. Then, uh, you see, we often use the point of view of a capitalist um, to represent this contradiction, but sometimes we use a point of view of the consumer. Here, for example, maybe I need to translate a stop rising cost of drugs. Uh, cocaine is mm, growing of 12%, uh, uh, marijuana 20 uh, and so on. We want to pay the crisis. This is a, um, a poster we put uh, in, the, um, in, a, in a quarter in, uh, in Rome with a huge media coverage. <laughs> okay. um, each of these projects come from uh, Guerrilla Marketing or Cook Art Agency. Uh, that is my uh, real agency. Uh, we use this project as art intervention and also as, uh, also as business experiment for the agency. Um, when someone uh, before asked uh, John Law about uh, the problem of the money, we, I and people uh, with will work with uh, create this agency that work in the market for pharmaceutical, political, or some for other stuff, and uh, we get money from them, try to be a team that work with this kind of project too. Finally, I want to present my, my very last work. Uh, I, have, I am uh, Professor I, Holmes. What? Um, I use uh, Hans Rollis of uh, Gapminder Foundation that shortly uh, introduced the, the concept. I am Professor Hans Rusling. This month, April 2015, more people than ever are drowning when traveling to Europe across the Mediterranean Sea. Some come to look for job, but many are refugees from war and oppression. But why do they travel over land to Libya to get onto these dangerous boats? Is it because they can't afford to fly with an airplane? Let's look at the numbers. A single ticket from Ethiopia all the way directly to Stockholm costs 400 euro. To fly from Lebanon to London is 400 euro. And you can buy a ticket to fly from Egypt to Rome in Italy for 320 euro. And the price to get onto these boats is consistently by media reported to be 1,000 euro or more. So to get on these crowded boats costs two to three times as much as to fly in a convenient airplane. So what exactly is it that stops the refugees from flying to Europe to apply for asylum? They can reach the airports, they can afford to buy a ticket, but at the check-in counter, they are stopped by the airlines from getting onto the airplane. And this is due to this European Union directive from 2001 that tells member countries how to combat illegal immigration. What this directive says is that every airline and boat line that bring a person without the proper documents for entry have to pay all the costs for returning that person back to their country of origin. 
And this is what makes commercial airlines not to allow people to board if they don't have all documents. But of course, this directive also says that it doesn't apply for refugees that want to come based on the Geneva Convention. The European government has escaped responsibility when they have transferred the task to decide who is a refugee and who is not a refugee to the staff at the check-in counter. So in practice, what is happening is that no one can board without the visa. So it is this directive that is the reason for so many refugees drowning in the Mediterranean Sea. So my question is, in a marketing point of view, why there is no airline company who decide to violate this directive? They could simply check before boarding if migrants is, are suitable for uh, refugee status. So I assume one do it. Who if not most disruptive in the business of air transportation? So, in September 3rd, uh, Ryan Fay is born. Uh, this is the, an easy website that I made uh, with uh, the same uh, aspect of the original Ryan Air uh, website. Uh, Kenny Jacobs, one of the Ryan Air marketing uh, manager, say, we are facing the biggest humanitarian emergency of our era, confirming our mission. Made air travel accessible to the masses. We decided to open to refugees our route from Greece and East Europe, violating the rule that simply dump government responsibility on the carrier. We will prove cover all costs of this violation. We want to give our small contribution to healing the suffering for thousands of refugees, we were forced to abandon their homes and flee for their life. We are confident that other carriers will join us in this campaign. This is, was the route. And that our later, thanks to DPA, Deutsche Press Argentur, we had the huge media coverage. Uh, yeah, it's Hungarian, uh, Italian, Ryanair first, uh, airline for refugees, and uh, so on. Not only, uh, we have a lot of uh, tweets. Wait, uh, Ryanair does what? Oh, uh, Ryanair not a sacrilege, no, for human humanitarianism uh, to help asylum seekers to fly Europe. But uh, a lot of people are very happy about that. Not only. If you look at NASDAQ, stock grow by half point in that hour. So everybody is happy about that. And for some minute, I, I say, maybe Ryanair could be silent and assume the position. Not. <laughs> uh, just some hour later, uh, they have to retreat uh, this uh, idea. I'm about to look at the, the last comment. Nobody ever believed that you would be that human. The point is not against the Ryanair, of course. The point is, is about the, the, the law that uh, forbidden migrants. Um, then uh, we have to explain, and we explain using our friends uh, Luther Blissett in the, uh, in the photos. Uh, and uh, with Luther Bistlet, uh, uh, he said he, he just wants to create an alternative possible reality where people do not die in the Mediter uh, Mediterranean Sea. It's the same fiction. You can suspend your disbelief about change. Uh, may you see positive comment uh, on uh, Twitter and Facebook too, positive uh, stock market reaction. But it seems it's not enough. They have to preserve this criminal reality. And so a week ago, we received, we received a letter from the, lawyer to, from the lawyer of Ryanair uh, 
uh, it seems they want to persecute uh, us for copyright infringement, uh, defamation, and uh, unfair business practices. That's uh, all. I'm time. <laughs> Thank you. I hope. To... Thank you. Brilliant, thank you so much, that was just great. Um, so, now to Mustafa Al-Bassam. Uh, Mustafa is an undergraduate at King's College London in computer science. Uh, he gained notoriety in 2011 for being part of LULTSEC, a computer hacking group responsible for a number of high profile attacks, including those on the CIA and Sony. Uh, as a result, he was legally banned from the internet for almost two years as a condition of his bail. It says on his website, for a couple of years I got into trouble, and you can go and find out more. Um, Mustafa's worked with Privacy International to analyze the destruction of computer equipment ordered by GCHQ that held top material leaked from the NSA and GCHQ. And he was portrayed as one of the main characters in Te Internet is a Serious Business, which is a uh, a play by Tim Bryce um, about internet culture. Um, he's advised human rights defenders around the world on protecting their data and communicating securely online. And during the Jasmine Revolution, he created a tool for Tunisian dissidents to defend themselves against government malware. So, handing over to you. Uh, does it work? Good. Hi, so yeah, I'm going to be talking a little bit about my experiences with online activism and hacking. But, and to start off, I want to say that, um, this is, and this is relevant, um, Germany is kind of a special place for me because as of when I was a five-year-old, I was uh, a refugee from Iraq, and re Germany was the first place that granted me and my family refugee status. Then also after that, we actually went to London, and that's where I live now. And it's kind of being an outsider there, I think, is kind of what sparked me to do activism and learn about technology and hacking and information security. But even though I kind of have a sort of playful mindset around with playing with data and, and facts, I've also have had that in the, offli in the offline world before I even started doing online activism. And this is in this sort of an example from when I was in secondary school. I was enrolled in this biology course. And I was really annoyed with the amount of homework that my teacher set. It was just a ridiculous, ridiculous amount of homework. And I was convinced that the homework wasn't really helpful at all. So, but the teacher put all, the teacher, the teacher had a public Google document of how many homeworks everyone completed and also the test score in a mock exam result. So just to sort of prove a point, I created this graph that plotted people's test scores and the amount of homework they completed. And it turned out there was a negative correlation between homework completed and test score. So in theory, the more homework you did, the lower your test score. And so that's kind of, I like to, pres to use data and facts and present them in a sort of way that invokes a reaction from people. And that was quite successful because everyone stopped doing their homework. <laughs> <laughs> I sort of got uh, interested in issues like freedom of information and privacy when I started um, using a website called the Pirate Bay, which is a, I'm sure you've heard of it, it's a website where you can download copyrighted films and music and et cetera. And you know, I, never, I never really thought about the, the ethics of it. I mean, obviously, it's illegal to download copyrighted materials, but 
one of the things that really inspired me is the way that the Pirate Bay responded to legal threats. They would receive a lot of legal threats from companies like Microsoft and DreamWorks and EA. And the way that they responded to it is completely ridiculous. So for example, one of the things they, one of, one of their responses, they sent back an invoice to one of the companies for the costs of the pants and floor cleaning due to wetting themselves because of their th scary threats. <laughs> and that's how, that kind of humor sort of really it sort of inspired me. <laughs> uh, I first started, I, um, I think my first sort of uh, clash with online activism is when Anonymous decided to DDoS the Recording Industry Association of America and the Motion Picture Association of America in retaliation for a company called iPlex Software that decided to take uh, piracy and justice into their hands by launching this denial, distributed denial of service attacks against the Pirate Bay. So Anonymous was sort of giving the industry a, a taste of its own medicine, so to speak. And you know that was that was kind of interesting back in the time because no one the distributed denial of service attack wasn't really a popular or known form for activism and. In, in 2010, it was sort of seen as the process of the future. But I think for me, it, it, you know, it, it has its limitation. It, it, gets, it gets old quickly if you, if you keep using it over again. It doesn't really actually have sort of a direct impact on the people that you're protesting against, except for maybe uh, causing more attention to them. But it's not really sort of a creative way to, to do activism. But the te technique has kind of changed a bit when there was this company called uh, ACS Law, which was a company hired by uh, companies that own copyrighted materials, mostly pornography companies, to try to prevent people from downloading their materials illegally on the website at the Pirate Bay. So what this company would do is they would go look at the torrents and look at the IP addresses of people that are downloading torrents of porn and gay porn material. And then they would blackmail them by sending them letters to say, pay up or we'll take you to court over this material that you've been downloading. Um, but the interesting thing was that their methodology was completely flawed. They simply got IP addresses of people downloading torrents and they would ask the internet service providers to give them the, rec the records, the subscriber records behind the people that were downloading, behind the IP addresses that were downloading information. But in the UK, all residential broadband connections use, use a dynamic IP, which means the IP address keeps changing. So the internet service provider might give you the latest subscriber information for, for the current time. But in most cases, it's not gonna be the actual person or subscriber that downloaded that thing. So they were basically targeting a lot of innocent people who had nothing to do with what they think. So Anonymous also did, did an uh, DDoS attack against them. But the interesting thing this time around is that in trying to prevent the, the attack, the administrator of the website tried to move the server to a different hosting provider that was better capable of dealing with that. And in the process of doing so, he accidentally made publicly available the entire backup of his server. And so, so if, you, if you knew where to look, you could download it. So I downloaded it and I uploaded the backup to the Pirate Bay. And the backup had some really interesting material. It had basically the entire company's emails. And those emails revealed some really interesting things about the shady activities that the company was doing. And the fact that it was essentially a blackmailing company rather than a law firm. And that had a lot of impact and journalists wrote a lot of articles about it. And the uh, SRA, which is the Solicitor Regulatory Authority in the UK, eventually some of that material helped to get him suspended from practicing law. So that's kind of when I realized that, you know, and I was 15 years old at that, 15 years old at that time. So, you know, if a 15 year old can do this from his bedroom or, and also if, I, that's kind of when I kind of realized that truth and information has a lot of uh, potential to change things. So I founded this online hacking group called Internet Feds, and you can see here this is the, in the one of the FBI, the FBI indictments for the Internet Feds to sort of explore this kind of um, tool to gather facts 
and expose facts and, and let society de decide on what to do with those facts. But we also did some humorous things. So this was a, this is, we hacked into a website called the Copyright Alliance, which is a lobbying group for, for, for the copyright industry. And we basically converted it, converted it to a online piracy website and we uploaded piracy materials on there. Well, I think one of the, the best things that we got involved in was the Arab Spring. Because a lot of the Arab Spring, protesters were organizing things online. So we also had a lot of uh, people in Tunisia and Egypt go into our chat rooms. And we, did, we, did, we decided to have, do something with that. So one of the silly, sillier things, but also good things we did was hack into the website of the Prime, Prime, uh, Tunisian Prime Minister to post, to post a message. And, but one of the more serious things that helped a lot of people was we developed this uh, browser plugin. So the Tunisian government at the time was, had a massive internet surveillance program that was quite intrusive. So what they would do is they would inject malicious JavaScript code into the, into the login pages of Facebook and Gmail and other providers. And that code would basically send um, your login details back to the Tunisian government every time you logged in. So we created this this online browser plugin to remove, to, to basically mitigate that, that that piece of malware, and it was downloaded quite a lot of times, five thousand times, and that had quite an impact. And the Tunis Tunisians, this is a, from a video of Tunisians thanking anonymous for their work. I think if there's one thing that I didn't re I don't regret, it's hacking the Westboro Baptist Church on, in a live radio show. That was probably one of the funnest things. Um, so after a while, is we, there was this group called Dulcic that we founded. So Dulcic was an offshoot of Anonymous because, and the reason why it was founded, it was sort of as an experimental sandbox to explore hacktivism, but not within the boundaries and rules of Anonymous. Anonymous had quite a lot of social rules, like you can't attack the media, and it was quite politically motivated. So Dulcic was sort of less, not, it, it wasn't politically motivated at all, but like the, the, uh, the uh, sort of uh, manifesto isn't politically tied to anything, it's just having fun. But it turns out that it actually did quite end up being political, because what's funny is also, what's, uh, what's funny and what's just is inherently connected to each other. So, for example, if someone who deserves something has something bad happen to them, that's funny. But if, some, if, if a charity, for example, got hacked, that's not, that's not funny. That's quite sad. And, you know, when, I, when, it was, when we started it, I didn't really expect for it to get a lot of public support because we were basically dumping data for, 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 you know, for fun. But so the amount of support I got, it got for it was quite a surprise for me. This is a poll on the website that says, were you entertained by LOLSEG? And apparently 75% of people were. Uh, apparently at one, at one point we, had, we were more popular, popular than One Direction. So we did a lot of sort of uh, humorous things like when, uh, when Obama treated hacking as an act of war, we hacked into an FBI affiliated website to leak 180 usernames and passwords from FBI agents. And it turns out that these FBI agents weren't following their own ha security handbooks and they were use reusing passwords everywhere. And we do things like uh, post fake news articles on the Sun website. Uh, this was when they were involved in the news, uh, in the phone hacking scandal. Uh, so we posted a fake news article proclaiming that Rupert Murdoch has reportedly been found dead in his garden after ingesting a large amount of quantity of palladium before stumbling into his famous Tipperary Garden. Yeah. So, you know, eventually, it, it didn't last very long. The FBI eventually um, arrested, I think, five of us. No, four of Yeah, five of us. Um, so, yeah, one, one, of, one of the people involved, we, I'm sure a lot of you know, is turned into was flipped over by the FBI and turned into an informant for a year. Um, but I, you know, I was quite lucky to get off relatively easy because I was sentenced to com committee service. 
which is quite lucky compared to what people are sentenced in the US. If you look at people like Jeremy Hammond, he was sentenced to 10 years in jail for what he did, which is ridiculous. But um, even then, after that, I, the FBI does a lot of ridiculous things, and I like to do some ridic ridiculous things back to them. So for example, I created a um, hidden service that you can, so to, to allow people to submit anonymous crime tips to the FBI. And this was a res my response to the FBI attacking Tor by um, so, um, li linking people to web pages that had browser exploits into hack, to in into hack people that were involved with drugs or whatnot. And one of the funnier things was this FBI agent called Chuck Esposito gave a talk at a conference. And he said he apparently, according to him, the only solution to stop anonymous is to get them all girlfriends. So I emailed the FBI to ask them for a girlfriend. <laughs> Unfortunately, they didn't respond yet. <laughs> this is, a web, this is uh, one of my websites called GCHU Careers. You can go through it right now. It's at gchu.careers. And it's basically <laughs> has a website with a lot of fake jobs to sort of highlight the activities of GCHQ and how ridiculous they are. So for example, you've got here a child porn, li child porn li librarian, and that's because they have a surveillance program to, uh, called Optic Nerve, which basically makes a copy and uh, records all the uh, video chats of yeah, people who use Yahoo webcams, the Yahoo Messenger service. And you've also got some jobs like Ecuadorian Embassy Cleaner. But I'm also, uh, I'm, I'm glad to have, I'm also do some, do some serious thing, stuff, like I volunteered with British International for a bit and I had the pleasure of actually analyzing some of the um, hardware that GCHU destroyed to figure out what we could learn about how, what's, about GCHU's data destruction methods. And that's all. Yeah. That's fine. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, next, uh, final speaker is Jean Peters, who is the, uh, also Paul von Ribeck, also Luther Blissett, uh, co-founder of the Pen Collective, a group of activists, artists, and media hackers. Um, the last time I saw him introduced, he claimed to be working for Google and Amazon and a whole load of uh, corporations as well as consultants. And in the last campaign, uh, Peng created an exit association for secret services to help them stop war crimes and mass surveillance uh, that built up a civil life. Okay, so take it away. Thank you. It's not? Yes, it is. So thank you very much, and I'm really impressed by um, this panel. I hope I can keep up with it a little bit. Um, so, yeah, I mean, my brain is still tickling from all these, all these people, also John Law. So um, I'll try to get quickly through it. So the, you mentioned Google, Google Nest, and basically yeah, what we do is... Um, with the Pen Collective, we are very frustrated about how the civil society is not keeping up with defending civil rights and, you know, like all the things that civil society should do against uh, other evil powers in the world, which are <laughs> mainly striving or coming from capitalism, I guess. Um, Whatsoever, I, I don't want to complain too much, and we, we started to do different stunts and actions to mainly inspire those who have a little bit more possibilities. So we hope that uh, all those NGOs which are um, there to defend the, the rights of uh, civilians are ho hopefully getting inspired by our tactics and strategies, and we are having fun developing them. So what we did, um, always being inspired by others as well from the social movement mainly. Um, we went through loads of different companies like Shell, like Google, and I can maybe um, just, oh wait, why is that not showing this one?
No. Right now. No, 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 no. Thousands no, 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 no. stop it. No, no. So can you reload this HTML? Just like a reload here? Um, ah. I changed it, yes. Can you go to the, to the, this, yeah. Ah, you still had the old one. Okay, let's see. Because I just added in two other actions before I talk about Intel Exit, so you can have a look at it. Um, so let's try this. So this is now in Firefox, right? Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, don't worry. Apricon? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Google Chrome, yes. So let's see if it worked. I just quickly added two parts. No, no, it's not in there. Okay, don't worry, don't worry. Uh, don't worry, I just skipped the Google part. Yeah, yeah, that's, it's fine. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's not in there, right? So, okay, so, um, yeah, we went as Google and so on, so we, we also created an anti-sexist bot army. You can basically look, look it up in our website where we were like automatically scanning Twitter for sexist behavior and inviting them to join a self-help cause to become a proper feminist within six days. Um, but so we are basically looking at new possibilities. So the, the problem we have with the surveillance state and with this huge global uh, movement of secret services trying to like uh, yeah collect metadata and kill people on on this basis going through Rammstein and and you know in, the, in Nevada having joysticks listening to heavy metal and k killing people in Pakistan this is so absurd that this is everyone knows that who wants to look it up online it's like the information is there and somehow this there is no global movement to to react to that and we research for a year, what can you do to mobilize people um, against secret services, or what can you do to like, yeah, I mean, we're still all using Facebook and all of this, this general like uh, frustration in, in social movement, what can you fucking do? And um, after a while we came to this idea to create uh, Intel Exit, which is basically an exit program for people working in the intelligence, which is a kind of, like uh, I think the, the work of you and like yeah it's, it's it somehow clicks very much and um, so yeah maybe I just show you the advertisement video it, it, we went to New York and to to London to to get people from different groups to work with us and what came out of it is a website where you have an automatic you have a test for people working in the secret services and they get an automatic resignation form that they can then fill out and give to the employees. And uh, here's the advertisement. Right now, thousands of people work in the shadows of the intelligence community. They don't ask questions. They follow orders, keep their heads down, do their work. But what happens when you see something you can't forget? When you realize that the system you are part of is chipping away at democracy every hour, every day. You feel stuck, overwhelmed. Some people have already made the decision to leave. Others are thinking about it every day. Intel Exit helps people break free from the intelligence community and build a new life. You expose yourself within the system, you're ultimately going to end up being forced out of the system. I remember confronting my immediate supervisor, the number three person, about what are we doing? We're in violation of the Constitution. Many Secret Service uh, employees are disillusioned. Why are we taking equipment that is traditionally foreign-facing, outward-facing, and we're now instrumenting our networks within the United States of America? If you are surveilling the population, you're all on the same side, right? You want all the data, and you want to talk to people who have the most data. So the NSA is a nexus of surveillance for the world. It's whatever you could get away with. That was part of the game. And it was ever whatever would serve in the interest of national security. 
when one is forced to act against one's moral values, he can experience extreme levels of what we call cognitive dissonance. Ich hatte damals keine Hilfe. Ich habe zehn Jahre gebraucht, um, um zu erkennen, wofür ich bei der Staatssicherheit verantwortlich gewesen bin. I was radioactive because I'm questioning what are we doing? Where do you then go? Where does your life then, where do you recreate your life? What Intellexa does is help individuals transition from the world on the inside to the world on the outside. Wissen Sie, dieser Intel Excel Verein ist wirklich eine gute Sache. The more you can move from the inside to the outside, the better you'll integrate into the real world. What is really great about Intel Exit is that it helps people to confront their fears. So take it from me, if you're looking to get out, try Intel Exit. Be smart. Exit intelligence now. So, so that was... <laughs> Okay, so, so now we had this uh, website, we had the advertisement video, but we want to really get this, these people out of there. So we basically got a truck to uh, go around the NSA in Maryland, and we went to their favorite coffee shop uh, at 2 o'clock p.m. where everyone would go and eat. Um, and it was basically like, you know, target, we do like you, you know, target group uh, advertising, very patriotic, uh, trying to get these people to understand that it doesn't make sense to continue what they're doing. Because many people are frustrated there, really. So we also went to the GCHQ in Cheltenham with um, another truck that we rented. And uh, this is the dagger complex. You had this list of where the people went to, to do ba baseball. This is the, the uh, dagger complex where all your data is, is the main hub in Europe, where everything is collected. We, so you can see the antenna of the dagger complex in the back. It's, it's a very shady area. It's difficult to get there. Um, but every employee has to pass by its billboard. So we bold, like very simple advertisers, basically. Nothing very guerrilla kind of thing, just advertising billboards. This is um, in front of the Wiesbaden, the uh, clay caserne. It's where the next bigger compound of, um, of the nexus of all data for Europe is going to be prepared actually this year. I don't know if it's going to still happen or, or next year. This is uh, the European, uh, the, uh, sorry, this is the US Embassy and it's a, in front of the Bundestag where they got like the intercept Bundestag, which is actually, I think it's fine to get Merkel's uh, data. I, I totally understand that. I just think they should stop it for civilians. Um, this is the BND, it's the German Secret Service, the new building, but obviously also the old building where they're still uh, working. And then we went to the Verfassungsschutz, the, the inner secret service. Uh, and so the name is funny because it's called, the, it's, it's there to secure the constitution, Verfassungsschutz. So we took the constitution, the German constitution, and we plastered it on the inner secret service, which is there to like secure the constitution. And obviously they tear apart the constitution <laughs> because they're not there to, uh, to protect it, but they're rather there to protect themselves and, and others that they, because you know, they, they supported Nazis to kill uh, foreigners in, in Germany. This is quite a big saying that unfortunately not enough people outside of Germany know. Um, but they do like big, big amount of money go to Nazi groups actually. Um, so then we went one step further. Yeah, so they really got our message. Uh, that was uh, the plan, and we wanted them to have like internal emails about this exit program, right? And um, it happened very quickly that we got people uh, from the Secret Service coming to us and uh, asking for help. 
So we were then a little bit surprised because we thought, like, it, yeah, we were not really sure it would happen. Obviously, we prepared for it, and um, we had all the means because you can't set this up without preparing for it. But most of the ex experts in the field were saying, but you know that no one will come, right? And we're like, yeah, sure. Let's see. This 1% happened um, of chance, and there's several people coming out to us. So now we are, uh, so I, I can just. Um, Oh no, right that's now, an HTML presentation. You will have to show me how I can stop this video restarting. It's always restarting. They don't ask questions. They stop follow it. orders. Stop it. Can you maybe just put the sound off? That's fine. Um, so, yeah, what's next? So now we are building up the infrastructure. That is uh, this, this fiction of uh, intellects that became real. Um, and so that means like very high security so, so that we can really secure the identity of those who want to come out. We never really know if they're there to infiltrate us, to know, like, to know how our structures work, but um, we will never know until the end uh, who is who, which is very funny. It's like in, in, in arts, you never really know what's real, what's not, and all. So, you know, that's work with secret services. Uh, there are mad people, unfortunately, not cases, who think they're followed by the CIA, and they obviously are not, but you never know, maybe they are. So uh, basically, we are also a honeypot for, um, for, for lunatics, who, by the way, there was one lunatic who then showed his, um, he, he was working for the GCHQ until 1984, and still now believes that they follow him. So there was some truth in his story, um, because of like, but then his proof was a picture of his grandfather's chicken farm, which was a little bit odd. But so there is also the lunatic who actually was working for the Secret Service, and I think there's quite a few of them. If you look at the uh, yeah, at the, the human stories of those who just you know they they were in a mad environment, so they they it's difficult to get back into civil life. Um, then we're obviously we're taking care of them. Uh, um, looking at what what can we do to support this uh, civil support um, and so the next step uh, not just fundraising but we'll we'll try to build up more outreach like um, to really get to their families to try to get all of you to support uh, so this is like campaigning thinking right like how to mobilize more people how to really build this up because I think also what we do is you mentioned it we don't look as at them like the GCHQ uh, does like data, but we look at them like human beings. So we're not interested in leaks. This is not what we do, but we are just opening the back door uh, for them to step out, to, to create a civil life, and to first of all stop doing what they do, which is like destroying democracy and being mass murderers or supporters of mass murderers. And um, all those who want to leak, because I can understand some people really have the urge to leak, uh, they, we, we give them the context to, you know, journalists, WikiLeaks, and all those, so um, we don't burn our fingers there. But, uh, so the, the one of the next steps, we're still quite small, we don't have a lot of capacity, so we are slow in developing, but, um, so, oh yeah, this is, I tried to look up nice quotes for the speech, so I just found this one, which is, uh, we, we don't really know where, where to go next, but, um, there is, I found then one quote from uh, Daniel Day Kim, who is a great philosopher and video, um, video game actor. Yeah, uh, and he was saying this, um, I didn't know him before, uh, he's I think from South Korea, and he said, there's as much wisdom in listening as there is in speaking, and that goes for all relationships, not just romantic ones. So I was very inspired by what he says, and uh, we are then thinking about creating a, Sorry, it's in German. Anruferin uh, is caller, so we're creating a um, um, call center where you all can call up the NSA through different servers. So you're kind of secured, um, and they can't follow back your phone number, but so it can be a Tor service. We don't, we're not really sure how we're going to build it yet, but you can, because we are going to get lists of direct desks from the NSA, GCHQ, and so on, uh, you can have a one-to-one uh, talk to your surveillance and ask how, how he or she is and you know how what he or she is doing and uh, eventually try to convince to stop working but this is up to you uh, we are going to give you a manual of, of you know manipulative tactics of like being very kind and you know caring or very aggressive there's all these classic 
call tender sync. So this is one of the next things we're working on. Um, and this is another quote I found, you know, spread love everywhere you go. Let no one ever come to you without leaving happier. So this will be, I guess, the goal of Intellex at, uh, at the end. I'm almost speechless. That was just a truly awesome set of presentations. Uh, I really did not expect to be in this moment uh, feeling so positive and optimism, optimistic, and kind of that, that was really a celebratory set of uh, presentations, which re actually just really surprises me. So thank you very much. And the, I, I guess the... The, the, one of the common factors in all the, all the presentations, which again surprised me, I don't know why, but it's just the, a kind of common thread of warmth. And possibly I spot a move in some of these, uh, the, I've, I've been paying attention to the, the practice of pranking and uh, stunts for many years, and it seems that there's a move away from uh, public spectacle and shock intended to make people feel uncomfortable to actually things which are genuinely more warm and engaging and where the surprise is actually that maybe you care and these are, this is this is actually kind of coming through in a lot of a lot of the tactics that you're using um i think one of the things that made me think that we might be feeling a bit depressed by this point was uh an announcement I read, I think it was posted on the NetTime mailing list uh, yesterday, about the, phone, the founder of Pirate Bay, who was interviewed on Motherboard, saying, right, that's it, I'm giving, I'm giving it all up, there's just no use, the internet's, we're done with the internet now, there's no space for the internet as a space for uh, making political and radical social change. And... I just wonder if I wonder if any of you would like to kind of respond to that because it seems it seems to me that you are all finding ways to do things which are just kind of moving on from moving on from maybe some of those early tactics. Good, Mustafa, you've picked up the yeah, microphone. Yeah, I mean, I, I saw that interview. Yeah. I mean, and I, and I completely disagree with it with him. Um, Good. I mean, you see, he's so. He sort of saw as um, the, the battle as like a either either win it or lose it, and I don't think I don't think it's that. I don't think it's either win it or lose it. I think it's um, there's always going to be good things and bad things in the world, and there should always be people trying to maximise the amount of good things. Now, if we had no, if we didn't, if we didn't have anyone at all fighting for your rights on the internet, internet freedom, the internet would be a much 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 worse place, right? He it might be a relatively bad place now, but if we just gave up, it will be a much worse place and you'll have much more suffering and less rights. So I don't think it's right to say we should just stop caring, we've lost the battle. It's not a binary win or lose. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, looked up, I really looked up a few quotes for this because I love quotes and talks. So now I have one from Gramsci saying uh, that um, I'm very pessimistic uh, intellectually, but I'm very optimistic in the will. And I think this is uh, the only way you can, can counter this horrible shit that's happening. And I actually, dis I, I don't know if you meant it like this, but I disagree that when you talked about anger, I think from anger comes a lot. And I'm, I think everything we do comes a lot also from anger. I still want to have fun and, you know, um, but uh, I, sometimes I, you have to be very careful that it doesn't swap into frustration too much, but that you keep up a little anger <laughs> and, you know, you channelize. So your relationships will be better and, you know, like everything's going to be fine in your private life. You push this anger into a political sphere. Uh. I don't agree with it, but I think that the internet is changing and there's increasing surveillance, increasing corporatization of the internet. And I think that there's a window where when that closes, if we don't do anything now, it will be a lot harder to do some of the things that we're doing today. And for a lot of people, I think it's already quite difficult. People who don't know how to use things like Tor and encryption, but want to do things that might otherwise be censored or that they might be targeted for. And I think that 
we need to figure out ways to make it easier for people to use the internet for those things and also decrease some of the surveillance and corporatization that's currently making it harder um, and that now is a crucial time for that. I don't think it's at the point where it's impossible yet, but it might be much, much, much more difficult if we keep waiting and we don't do anything now. <laughs> do you have anything you'd like to add, Andrea? No, I... Uh, it's it's a little bit difficult for me, but, uh, <laughs> that, but I, and the, the, my idea is that if surveillance stop any form of reaction, of creative re uh, reaction, I think uh, that, no, yeah, that they, they won't simply because exist before any uh, real control. So I need, we have to transform our anger in creativity in a creative way and with you because the boredom are the enemy Antes before the, uh, the control. But I think the question is important. I don't believe we'll win. I mean, I don't know what it means to win, but if if so, and we believe, okay, we can whatever, like stop that. Uh, I'm very very pessimistic, and we're really all fucked. Still, I mean, what can we do now? Like. Can we just say, okay, we're all fucked, or can we have fun and fighting it a little bit? So at least, I'm, I'm a little bit pro Protestant there, maybe in my mind, but then when I'm dying, I'm saying I tried, you know? Like, as that's, that's all, all we can get, I think. We, are we yeah. I agree. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm, I'm going to direct one more question directly to Andrea, because I think you, you're doing something uh, that's a little bit different to some of the other things that we saw, which is you're engaging with markets yeah. in a very particular way. And I wonder, and it strikes me that regardless of what is happening in the world of surveillance on the internet, that the, the way the markets are operating and that, that this is still a very live area that there is still a lot of work that can be done. So I just, I, th I, w I wondered whether, yeah. I, I think no, we need surveillance because we need to, to, to save the market. So, of course, uh, 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 the way uh, which market use some information about citizen is uh, uh, a lower level respect the information that need the surveillance to, to preserve the whole market area. I don't, I'm not sure you are asking about that, but I, I'm with them that work uh, exactly in the, in the question. And at uh, the same time, when you use this kind of tactics, uh, you are an uh, object of surveillance sometimes. Okay, thank you. Now I'm going to open up to the floor. There are many, many people with their hands up. No, it is working. Okay. Hi, thank you very much for all this. It was very, uh, very, very interesting and actually very inspiring in many ways. I'm very, very impressed. Um, I'd like to maybe uh, zoom out a little bit and step back because I was just like listening to you and I had trouble relating what you were saying to a broader political spectrum. And what I mean by this is like, um, I mean, okay, I'm, I'm going to try to put it in a simple way, but uh, I was a bit confused by this. For example, when you're saying what you have in common, obviously, and, and I totally agree with this, is we have to kind of uh, fight this Mon fight back this monitoring and this kind of uh, NSA surveillance which kind of totally invading privacy and uh, citizens' privacy and people should be aware of it and how we can do it, etc. What I would like to ask you is don't you think there is a need for surveillance in certain cases and how do you make a part and you know, how can you tell, I mean, don't we need, you know, we could be totally anarchist and say we don't need state at all or we don't need any intelligence agencies and we don't need anyone and I guess uh, what makes me think about this is just 
before coming here, I was doing another, I mean, I was doing, I'm a journalist for Expediner, and I was doing an interview with someone who just did a movie about the uh, uh, Charlie Hebdo attacks, and, uh, and we were talking, of course, about the Paris attacks and about terrorism, and I know it sounds like two different worlds here, and I don't know how they relate anymore. You know, you have people t telling you, but we were killed by terrorists. We need surveillance to go against this, or some kind of surveillance. So my question is, is there such a thing as uh, a civil liberties or, or like um, privacy, um, uh, respectful type of surveillance, and how, do, and, how do you, and how do you react to that? I'm sorry to be a little bit of a devil's advocate here, but I think it's a kind of interesting question as well, right? I'm very glad you asked that. It, yes, it's a good question. Who, who would like to respond first? I'm sure everyone is thinking about it. Uh, first of all, um, I think so, pe a lot, many people think that we need surveillance for things that we don't really need surveillance for. For example, the Charlie Hebdo attacks and terrorist attacks. A lot of people think that we need surveillance and mass surveillance for that. But I mean, if you look at, for example, um, the, uh, for example, reports released by the White House that described how, that explained how many terrorist attacks exactly that NSA surveillance has prevented. It, first of all, it started out as, as 21, and then they, they, rejected, they changed it to 10, then 5, then 1, then the final number is 0. So, I mean, do we, really, do we, do we need surveillance? I mean, to, to stop terrorists? I think the question is, um, I mean, is surveillance really that, does surveillance really stop terrorism? Does it, does it, I mean, a lot of people think that surveillance is the answer, but the, the evidence and the facts show that it's not the answer. Uh, I think a more productive strategy than trying to find terrorists would be to try to figure out why people become terrorists and if we're doing anything to encourage that. The other problem with surveillance is that even if someone did make some ju perfect justification that it was being used for a good reason, it gets out of hand very, very quickly, especially due to the secrecy. So even if there were such a justification, there would be, need to be so much publicity about the surveillance methods just because it can get so quickly out of hand that it's not really a viable solution, even if there were justification. Okay, so no, I think th there's not one solution, for sure not. Uh, I think one evidence-based surveillance is a very good like idea of as a concept. Still, there are problems in it, but that means like, okay, whatever surveillance you do, you have to prove that it's, it works. And this would basically mean that 99% of all surveillance measures are gonna be killed from today to tomorrow, because it's not provable, especially they try, I think there's one case where there was a mass surveillance um, a success of, I think, was a drug trafficker somewhere in Nevada. So this is what we're looking at. And um, what interests me is how quickly you get the public opinion to swap after a few terrorist attacks, sorry, horrible terrorist attacks, you get the public opinion to swap to say, okay, actually, surveil us. Because you can, um, the, the, the old school one-to-one -one surveillance uh, where human beings are interacting with other human beings and uh, infiltrating networks is, this which is known as maybe like working better in a way, but still is highly problematic as well. Um, and I don't know, but I would, I would rather also look at, um, like I think yes, certain people have to be surveilled uh, in a very transparent way. I think Merkel is one of them for sure. Uh, and I think all other like power striving politicians are part of it as well, not in their private life, but in the public life. And I think um, those who are, those agencies who are working to, to count as counter-terrorism agencies, they should be very fully transparent in how they do it. Not in every little case, always you know, putting publicly, now I have this and this person in my surveillance category, but like uh, there should be much higher means of controlling them because otherwise we have a falling out apart democracy. And this is what we, don't want. And when you look at Demolition Man, it's a Sylvester Stallone half sexist movie from 90s. He was coming back to the future and looking at camera and very clearly saying, oh, fascism. You know, that was fascism. And today we just have cameras there and no one complains. And I don't get that. I don't understand how public opinion can like 
just accept. And, and then nowadays even wonder, oh, maybe we should bomb ISIS and every, everyone, you know, like just go and bomb. And people are like, yeah, that's a solution, right? But I, can, you, can we not be a bit more careful about like now starting a war that is having like historically been proven to just raise the problems and, and then do mass surveillance? I don't, you know, I think I'm very, so, so there I'm angry, and, and then we try to find other ways for that. I, I had a microphone. <laughs> Hi. Someone yeah. has the microphone yeah. over there. Uh, Thank you. The other microphone. Um, yeah, so, well, my, my question was sort of related to the previous one, so I'm, I'm going to try to phrase it a bit differently. Uh, but, yeah, I'm... I'm originally from Paris, and uh, I was obviously very affected by, by what happened both with the Charlie Hebdo attacks and, and, and uh, yeah, the, the recent events. Uh, and the, the, the main question I've been asking myself uh, after reading a lot about like, what the reasons are, and obviously like, going uh, to wars and bombing people in the first place is a big... <laughs> a big uh, um, a trigger for more terrorism, so I'm being really appalled to see that we just call for more of this, more of the same as a response. Uh, the rise of the extreme right in France is extremely concerning as well, and um, and yeah, the knee-jerk reaction, the general knee-jerk reaction of, of politicians and as well as my uh, my um, uh, compatriots uh, is 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 really something I, I don't know how to respond to, and I, I wonder, like as a as just a single citizen with with a, a modicum of technical knowledge, uh, what what can I do or what can we do to um, to spread like to, to fight ignorance and uh, and and uh, vouch for a more responsible uh, response in case of these events, which obviously trigger all sorts of emotional responses. It's a, yeah, it may be many questions, but yeah, what can we, basically what can, uh, what can a normal person do um, to, to promote more responsible um, answer to these things and, and maybe lobby for, for uh, a more responsible, more, um, yeah, uh, reflected uh, answer, if anything. Silence. <laughs> what can we do well, to uh, save depressing. the world? <laughs> well, it, it may be that we've just been... I, uh, my, my gut feeling is that I think we've just been hearing these four people talk for the last hour about what they think that we can do. No, Actually, well, I mean, perhaps it, it's, it's a very valuable question. I yeah. think my answer would be let's sit together and talk about it because it's very individual. There's not the one answer, right? I think um, everything we do is, is, is part of our personal history and also from our context we come from. So there's not the one thing. I mean, I can tell you, like, you know, read more and then act more, but this is like, I don't know, this is not really helpful, I guess. So um, especially being, being confronted with terrorist acts of, uh, of this scale, which are highly impacting, uh, I think, for me, it's, it's a time where I don't want to speak first because I don't know the Middle East. I have no idea. I'm not an expert in Middle East, right? And this is something which makes me in, 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 incapable of saying what to do. And I think all those who say, like, war, 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 like, all, I mean, I heard so many different pacifist approaches where I'm sure, okay, because I'm not sure what to do, I would start with that maybe. And you know, then then go ahead. But I don't know. I, I wouldn't. I mean, you can go to Raj, Rojava with a r rifle, um, but I don't know if that's a good idea. It apparently is a good thing to do. I don't know. MC. Um, I think it is very personal, and a lot of the problem is figuring out what to do. But generally, at a high level, I think actions that discourage fear-based narratives are probably some of the most productive steps. Thank you. Um, who would like, okay, the gentleman at the back there. Ah, <clears throat> well, compliment for the wonderful panel. Um, the previous question was about uh, terrorism. I keep the same uh, things. 
If you have uh, one month of time and a limited resource, how you can take fun of ISIS? Do you have in mind some kind of prank to take fun of, uh, of ISIS? What you can do in a... Yeah. Yeah, ISIS is under, underwritten originally by the United States government as a way to battle other, you know, other parts of uh, other groups in that area. We we finance them. So a good place to start would be getting our my government to not finance these fuckers. So so it's funny that you mentioned uh, pranking ISIS because I think yesterday um, was anonymous has this thing where yesterday was uh, I think or today was. Pranking ISIS Day, and it was basically uh, a, a, a day where everyone is supposed to send uh, goatsy to ISIS on to, on Twitter, and you know weird things like that. But also, I've noticed that anonymous have been Rick rolling ISIS. Yeah, that too. Kind of regular. But I, I would not go and infiltrate them. This is like, and then, you know, <laughs> have a speech and like make a lot of fun. And <laughs> this is something I would just don't, don't better, not yet. I think we choose this kind of act just because we think this is the last month of our life. Otherwise, maybe we, we was involved in a, in a traditional way to be and do politics. It's clear. Also, I'm, I was interested in what you said, Jan, about feeling that you don't know anything about the Middle East, like you don't feel like you know enough to be able to speak, and I think that this is also an area that we, uh, that there's some work to be done in, which is actually making these connections more, and you're pointing at it a little bit, MC, I think, with this idea of making a human connection with uh, intelligence agents. I think maybe this kind of re reaching out and connecting across difference and across cultural difference, I think there's work to be done, m massive work to be done there online and kind of amongst ourselves so in, in very multi, uh, multicultural, multi-ethnic uh, towns like Berlin and London. Um, yeah, Marie? I, I um, just noticed that the, the Intel Exit uh, slogan was backdoor to democracy. And uh, just, um, I think they hadn't yet killed the, the terrorist in Saint Denis in the ASSO, uh, you know, after the last attacks in Paris, that the CIA, uh, CIA uh, said, um, okay, again, ask for the back doors and uh, asked uh, for uh, uh, Google and all the big companies to give access to, to their data uh, because uh, the terrorists, uh, you couldn't catch them. They went without surveillance, etc. But in the case of the last attacks in France, we knew everyone. I mean, they knew everyone. Uh, they, it was the same uh, filière. It was the same people that uh, Charlie Hebdo, you can just trace them, you know, you had just to listen. And they knew them because, the, you know, very, very uh, fast after the attack, we had the, the name, name of them. They had all uh, surveillance uh, report, you know. So, it, and despite that, they made the, um, uh, the uh, massive uh, surveillance law uh, in France uh, in uh, last September. And uh, it's like completely, uh, uh, in a, uh, it doesn't work, you know. And as you, to as you said, it's uh, much more efficient. Like old school uh, surveillance looks like m much more efficient than the mass surveillance where they find nothing. Uh, just false positives, and uh, now they they use also the the emergency state, you know, to uh, uh, assign people at their home, like uh, ecologist militants, and uh, after I don't know, maybe journalists working on uh, on you know like things they don't like. I, you don't know, but it's completely inefficient. I just want to say that I think what uh, was the result of that is to establish a politics of fear. 
So I think that is the and I think that's what we just saw in this panel, for me, was also a way to react to a politics of fear. And what you say, that you got a feeling of positivity, I don't think should be totally dismissed as we don't need this kind of practices because now we should feel that we believe in surveillance and fear because we still have to understand how we can react to that. And I think what we find actually in this kind of practices that come from hacking, disruption, and even you know, from the 70s and 60s, from what John Lowe was saying before, is, pos is perhaps a positive answer of how you can still be um, successful in responding to surveillance, but uh, without just being blocked by fear. Because I think if then you establish surveillance everywhere, then there is no space for new imagination. So this is the way I think it's really important what you are doing because it's a way to react in a totally constructive way to the situation we have today. I just want, I just want to say about this fear. Uh, thank you, Tatiana, and I agree with you what you say. Um, still, I'm a little bit ambivalent about this idea of fear is something bad and whatever, whatever, because if you look, and I'm not sure if it's good or bad, but if you look at the social movements in Germany from the 80s, there was a lot of, like, a lot of power coming from fear that was uh, anti-nuclear. So this whole anti-nuclear movement, anti-war movement, was so full of fear for our poor little children, and they were from there able to, like, um, well, become the world's biggest anti-nuclear movement. So also in fear, um, I think it's like a, it's a dosage or something. I don't know, but it's like it depends on what you fear. Or, I don't know, but I think. But, but a, a clear difference between that is that the anti-nuclear movement they felt fear and they were noisy and protested, whereas at the moment people, the people who feel fear, then silence themselves. So it's mm -hmm. a close. It's kind of like it has. It's having this opposite effect, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Um, we you. have a yes. Okay, I'm I'm really glad, Ruth, that you brought up the the Peter Sunda article because I read that at the same time as I was surfing a lot of information about the COP21, and you know, sort of juxtap juxtaposing this information in my head, I was reading that like 760 million indigenous people have may have been written out of the corporate uh, charter agreements that are now gonna be in the climate negotiations. And it was making me think that there's something valuable in what Peter Zunda said. Uh, I know he's really depressed and having just spent a year in jail, but I think he might have been implying that people who have incredible tech skills, like all of you, and using this in very tactical ways, that maybe it would be, um, like he was saying, what you know, we might lose the internet, and a lot of the tactical tech people that I know are like in a chess match with like a very empowered, super rich um, entities that are controlling these tech tools. But what if we turned our tech tools more towards being in solidarity with the people who are fighting to win back the earth? Because I'd rather win the earth than the internet. And I think if, if we don't win back the earth and just have a fucked up internet uh, existence, um, we've really lost everything. So, you know, I'd just like to ask all of you who have these incredible skills for tactical tech, let's, let's show some solidarity for uh, people like the indigenous struggles who, who will die without us intervening in these kinds of like Western world negotiations over their lives. So, just a kind of suggestion. I'm, I'm going to take a couple more and then we need to wrap up. So, uh, at the back on the same row. Yeah, I want to react to what uh, Paola just said. Um, I totally agree with um, we need to win back the earth and um, uh, support the indigenous and so on, but I would totally not make a difference between the internet and the earth because if you look at, look at it from a neurological point of view, human beings are part of the earth and being cooperative is like the epitome of being human so we cannot afford to let the internet go. And also speaking of fear, um, um, 
I, I don't know how to differentiate what it was in the 1980s with the anti-nuclear movement or not, but um, what I recently thought was very interesting um, to look into also, again, <laughs> neurology, because um, like trust produces trust and fear produces fear, really, if you just look into what happens, how people react to each other, and maybe that there is also um, uh, a domain where we can look into and work with it. And um, I don't want to reproduce the pessimism of the first round uh, that the moderators read a bit. Um, but then again, at the same time, I had a feeling during listening to you, which was really a pleasure, was great fun, and the projects are really fantastic. But at the same time, I had the feeling I've been to a panel like that 15 years ago, ago already, featuring Artmark, um, Uwe Morgan, um, Deportation Class, which is pretty much like Ryan Fair, um, and on Schleusernet, and all these great projects that have already been there 15 years ago, which were pretty similar, which were already working with um, over-affirmation and appropriation and all that kind of exposing. And I thought, like, it's the same strategies, and I think on the one hand it's really good that it's the s same strategies because it's taking away the fear, what Tatiana said, and it's very important that we keep cool and keep human, but at the same time I think, um, I don't know, we need parallel strategies, and some of, some of those projects are parallel strategies already, but maybe you look, look back into um, artist activism also and um, compare and see how much more complex it has become, and maybe the strategies also need to maybe target educational contexts more, not just the sexy top-level media stuff or so. I think that we really have to uh, wind up. Um, Tatiana wants John to have the mic. Okay, okay. Um, so, so I just want to, do any of our panel want to respond to any of the, la the last two comments? Because I think these are kind of new points that we haven't thought about. Do you? I would, did you have a question or did you, because I wasn't sure I could hear a question. Okay, yeah, cool. No, I wasn't sure. Um, I think for me, I heard two questions. One, do we uh, keep a sustained pressure on maintaining the emancipatory qualities of the internet that we care for? Or yeah. are we somehow losing focus on a more urgent question in relation to the environment? That was one. And the second one that I heard was this question about, uh, is there anything, does it matter that there, if, if we're using the same tactics 15 years on that were employed, uh, that have been employed, that, that I'm, the question to me is whether that matters, but I think it's yeah. like we're, yeah. So I can quickly say yes uh, to you, yes, absolutely. And we're, like, I clearly say that uh, uh, there is the, the um, digital division, or however you want to call it, at Greenpeace that is still understaffed and um, needs to happen faster. So all you donate to us and we can maybe do it, but we do what we do, like, and I would totally encourage that. Um, and to the does it matter question, I think uh, that absolutely, like I, I'm very, very inspired and, and I work together with Liz from Uber Morgan and you know, yes man, it's, and I think that it's something, uh, I would never delegitimize something that is copying a good thing. So um, it's, it's the art field that often feels it has to be new, 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 new. And um, <laughs> I, I don't see that as, as long as it works. And as soon as it doesn't work, then yeah, then maybe some little bit new. MC. Um, a response to the second question. I think that yes, there has been a lot less progress in a lot of areas than there should be. And we need to start thinking a lot more about the particular objectives that we want and also tracking the results that we get from using different tactics, trying to understand what tactics are most effective in what situations. And I think that there's a saying that there are no new ideas and that people combine ideas in new ways. I think that's maybe similar with tactics and strategies. There might not be a lot of entirely new tactics and strategies, but we can figure out how to combine and use them in the most effective ways, and we need to be putting more time and effort into that, I think, definitely. Do either of you have anything you want to add, or do you feel you've said everything you need to say right now? Okay. Okay, so before we uh, thank the panel for their 
for, for their provocations and brilliant conversation, I think. Um, Tatiana is going to come back to the stage and uh, wrap up the entire Disruption Network Lab series. And I think we're going to have yeah, no, but first I would say we should thank all of you and you deserve your great applause. So I see already that some people are leaving uh, and uh, of course I understand so I will try to be short and uh, you know I was kind of thinking how to end up this uh, great year of practices and uh, disruptions and you know I would say that the artistic uh, director's final statement sounds really boring and pretentious <laughs> so I'm not actually delivering you any statement, but we didn't know how to call it, so we actually like to copy something and position it again as new. But, uh, you know, because I also think uh, just uh, was really interesting uh, debate, I would say, and also I, I feel to answer, and uh, maybe now I, uh, you know, take a bit uh, my role. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, doesn't mean that uh, if in the past there have been some revolutions, then you have not to do them anymore because they have been done already. So I totally think that if there are people that still use uh, tactics and strategies that are effective and bring a change and uh, most of all make more understanding uh, things that not, uh, are not accessible for everybody or are secret or not understandable, then I think it's something we actually should try to bring uh, uh, ahead. So I would say that uh, I would hope that uh, this uh, panel and all these events that we have been doing for this year is, is something that perhaps will also bring uh, people doing more things like that because I don't think there is never enough. And I totally believe that uh, we should not be stopped by politics of fear because that is uh, perhaps the results that uh, many people are expecting on us. So, uh, just I want to uh, conclude a bit this um, uh, experience and I have to say that uh, we hope also to go on next year. We are waiting for the confirmation, or maybe not, <laughs> of our funds. So, we already apply to the Abstadt Culture Funds and uh, so we don't know yet, but we plan another year of great events. So, we really hope this is going to happen. Hopefully, you will know. Um, and I just wanted to conclude opening a bit up our box and uh, trying to explain you also what we have been doing this year. And I feel also that a lot of the events that we have been doing are, are about people and about uh, connections. That is why the whole program is called Disruption Network Club, because from one side we really try to establish network not only among the people that participate, but also among the different events that we have been doing. And so the idea was to also try to go beyond just the digital culture uh, to bring together practices that are not often connected, like for example, sexuality, pornography, hacking, activism, politics, uh, and other common life practices that are also part of popular culture, if you want. And um, so this is what we have been doing, a sort of montage methodology. I try to define it like that. That is a way also to imagine um, an artistic practice of a curatorial program, not only on, about the events that, that you do, but also about the relationship of people that you have before and after that. And so, um, I would like also to go on and show you where a bit of the roots of all these uh, programs that are coming also from, from my personal uh, research on disruption and also I want to say that uh, for this specific event we have a collaboration with the Axioma Institute for Contemporary Art in Ljubljana and we did before the starting of the Disruption Network Club a big uh, operation of having uh, um, an exhibition about network disruption that was traveling in various European cities. And I want to mention that because with this event we are also launching the catalog, so if you want you can get it 
at the counter desk or you can download it for free online. That is also a nice thing. And uh, I wanted to mention this also because many of the people that you saw today somehow were involved in this exhibition, like uh, uh, John Law was there and also um, the, I, I collaborated strictly with Gabriella Coleman for the anonymous section that was also um, speaking about anti-sec uh, and Jeremy Hamlon, Barry Brown, and also there was Luther Blissett, uh, the Peng Collective, and a lot of other great projects. And after that uh, was March 2015, at, at, in April was then the beginning of the Disruption Lab. You can see how many people were Oops, uh, we're in the, in the panel at the end of the exhibition. So also people that have been really important for me in the past years, like uh, the Telecommunist, for example, Vittore Baroni, Florian Kramer, and so on. So if we go on, then in uh, April, we had the first event that was uh, drones, uh, eyes from a distance, and we invited uh, um, Brandon Bryant, our uh, that was our keynote speaker. Uh, I don't know, probably now many people of you know, uh, but uh, he's a former drone operator that uh, did a really touching and important speech at the time. And uh, after him, then we had a collective panel with many people working on the discourse of warfare, um, like investigative journalists, uh, uh, also activists, uh, um, and... Uh, I mean, you can see some of, the, some of them there. And the second event we did uh, in uh, May was called Cyborg, Hacktivist, Freaks and Hybrid Uprising. And also there, the idea was to bring together various expertise like hackers, cyber feminists, transgender activists, uh, artists, uh, to speak about the concept of cyborg as a political context of intervention. That was also the moment in which we did uh, uh, a partnership with the Loifana University of Lüneburg by translating for the first time into English the book from Antonio Caronia that is called The Cyborg. Then in August, uh, uh, the 8th and 9th of August, was also great events that happened thanks to also wonderful collaboration with Gabriel Moses and uh, was called A Game of You into the social media vortex. And there we were discussing about uh, how from one side you can survive into the uh, wild torrent of our digital life uh, uh, from bots, uh, the moment in which you are trapped into the social media vortex or you react against that by creating new form of imagination. So we were discussing about Gamergate, the techno viking and the smart media's psychedelic web comics. And uh, in uh, September, uh, we had a partnership with uh, the Nome Gallery, and we, uh, with that occasion, uh, opened the first solo exhibition of uh, uh, Jay Kappelbaum and his uh, wonderful infrared uh, photography that was called Summit's Data Evidence of Conspiracy. So, the event that then we did there that had the title Tactics and Strategy of Resistance was instead about the idea of how also to try to find a positive outcome to surveillance at the same time also reflects uh, uh, on form of resistance against uh, that. And uh, the last event before this one was Porn Tubes, sharing the explicit, and there we uh, um, invited uh, people coming from another world, but also related, uh, people working with pornography, sexuality, queer culture, and we were discussing uh, uh, how the tubes are changing the imaginary, the production and distribution of pornography, and at the same time how pornography is uh, in the tubes a really big monopoly. And so we go back to today. Uh, and I want to announce you that after that, there will be our party, the final party at uh, the Spectrum uh, project space in Kreuzberg from 10. So you are all invited to come there and celebrate with us uh, one year of disruption. And uh, I would like uh, first, uh, I mean, now is an important moment, uh, and I'm sure 
that they don't expect that. <laughs> but uh, I really would like to invite here on the stage with me the people that uh, have been doing the Disruption Network Club for the whole year that are Daniela Silvestrin and Kim Foss, because we have really to do a big applause, applause to them, because they are also the Disruption Network Club. So I really want to thank you because this has been a really wonderful year with you. And uh, now I think that we are all together. With, we can also thank the people that have been working with us uh, for the whole year. So sorry, maybe now is a bit boring, but I have to do a list of names. So please don't leave in this uh, really touching moment that I almost feel to cry. <laughs> and uh, um, OK, we have to thank, first of all, Stefan Bauer, that is uh, the director of the Kunst and Kreuzberg Betanian, that is the art institution downstairs. That's, uh, I think, if we are here, it was, is also thanked to him. And also Ulrike Jordan, the assistant of Stefan Bauer, that have been speaking with us a lot about logistic chairs, uh, timing. <laughs> and so she really deserves our thanks. Uh, and uh, all the people of the Kunst and Kreuzberg Betanien. And then uh, uh, we want to thank Jonas Franke, that's our wonderful visual designer. <laughs> So, I mean, we, I was actually thinking, should we all go on stage? And then the answer was no. So, I mean, okay, they don't want to be here on stage. <laughs> but uh, uh, I think that uh, perhaps you are already on stage with your, your own wonderful graphic that you have done for us. And uh, then Elisabeth Enke and Silvio Frank, our wonderful technology support. and Gonzalo Rofo Erreitz and Angel Garcia Gimzet from the Rofso film. So sorry if I <laughs> probably say your name in the wrong pronunciation. Hey, Gonzalo is there. And all the, the team that did our video documentation always uh, in a great way. Maria Silvano, our photographer, sitting there. And uh, also Nadine uh, Nelken that has been uh, uh, supporting us with the photo and also with the Free Chelsea Initiative that has been with us a lot. So I want to thank also the whole Free Chelsea Initiative for being, Free Chelsea Manning, sorry, for being uh, with us uh, many times. And, um, and then Christian Trumer and Roman Kaiser, the helpers that have been building up the space all the time. Helena Knorr for the cash desk. Today we have another person. Yeah, Antonia Eichenauer. Okay. <laughs> and um, Ryan Taylor that has been doing the streaming today. And our great uh, radio on team that also did always the uh, radio documentation after our events. And Voice of Republic as well, they have been doing too. And uh, so I think now the list <laughs> is finished. Hopefully I didn't you know, forget people. Also, I think uh, um, Gabriel, we should thank him too. Uh, Gabriel. Uh, <laughs> surname we don't say because he wants to be anonymous. And uh, yeah, so thanks a lot for having passed this great moment with us. And uh, so hopefully see you next year, who knows? Uh, and thanks uh, to all our great participants of today and the past editions.